has now come from environmental planning. She's a journalist, she writes articles, but what I like the most is she was a lecturer in the Department of Geography and the Environmental Sciences at the University of Witwatersrand. And now she is where she is, writing articles and using Facebook and Twitter and all the telephones and bringing out educational literature all over the country, from one extreme to the other. Fascinating talk. Thank you so much, Kate. Bit of technical details going on here. Be with us. I don't have a man's pocket. It causes havoc when the technical details come through. No? Technical is not working. Hildegard, you're honestly terrified. Oh, look. I will you. We're going to have to do a serious wake-up call here. I do pictures. Uh, Hildegard is, is the queen of, of, of uh, science, and uh, my world is, is pictures, and my world is talking to the public. Um, I'm the interface between the government and the public, and I'm very delighted here that we've got Hildegard, obviously one of our chief scientists in our world. We've got Patoli here, who's the king of pom-pom, and runs at least 300 uh, uh, teams across uh, Gauteng um, and Lipopo and, and Northwest. And of course we've got our, our colleagues from Sanby here who are the, she does quite a lot on, on cactus. So we're a big team here um, and uh, obviously we're into marketing and promotions and I'm going to go very fast. This is actually a PowerPoint presentation but it's going to look like a video. So don't sleep. <laughs> what are we, who are we, how do we operate? I'm from environmental programs. Um, we are a unit. We started out as the nurseries and pet trade partnership. Um, I was uh, uh, got by Guy, uh, Preston and Christo and Nevan Torba a couple of years ago to come and help them. And consequently, I'm at the forefront of conflict. I'm at the forefront of partnerships. And you are very important people to us. And I have been sent here as a targeted, coated, shotgun with herbicide <laughs> to infiltrate the conservancies and make sure that an active but we need your help and we need you to come and help us. Uh, who are we? Environmental programs is probably one of the largest state operations in the country at the moment. It has 1.2 billion, up from 700 million from two years ago. It is the major job creation operation for the government. Um, and in actual fact, it's a, it's a, it's a culmination of re uh, natural resource management programs, which is the old uh, Department of Water Affairs, which includes, uh, as I might say here, includes actually uh, working on fire and uh, working for water. So we all talk, we say we're coming from working for water, but they're embedded quite far down on environmental programs. And EPIP, uh, which is in actual fact the old DR operation, which is working for the coast, working for waste. This is a very, very big operation at the moment. This is just numbers. I think what's critical, and I uh, haven't uh, quite worked out uh, where the, uh, the pointer thing is yet. Um, uh, there it is. What's critical here, I think, is 2012-2013. Uh, to have a look here, 1.1 billion is what they expenditure. 12, uh, 12, uh, 12,000 people working uh, full time, and it's person days, and there's lots of complications. But to all intents and purposes, 12,000 people, even if they are sort of job sharing. Um, and then here we've got EPIP, that's working for the coast, working for waste, and 5,000 people working for working on fire. And obviously, uh, hugely from when they were given 27 million in 1995, and now they're 1.2 billion. Uh, this is where they're going, and this is where we need your help, because in actual fact, we're hoping that conservancies are going to come on board. This is basically what, 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 the, what the story is for the future, and as you can see here, working for water is going to 1.2 2 billion and it's going all the way up to 1.4 billion. So we probably are, we're in a growth industry. Invasives is a growth industry. So you want to come on board and you want to be part of us. How did it happen? I'm talking to a very informed audience here. We have senior scientists, we have senior implementers, we have legends like John Ledger and we have uh, mind strategists like uh, Andrew Barker here. This is, I'm going to move fast. 
we all know there's a serious problem. Uh, mechanical and chemical control is needed big time. That's the kind of money that is projected uh, that's going to be needed to take these things away in terms of invasive species, 123 years to clear the, the free state. This is, this is a growth industry. This is not going anywhere and we've got a lot of time on our hands that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, in terms of the water that invasives are deemed uh, by our colleagues at the CSIA to have uh, taken out of streams, uh, there are all the figures um, from 76 million down to 240 million. That particular 247 million is very large because obviously it's a very large area it takes out of and includes two major, major rivers. These are the uh, areas. And of course, the, the, the concept for anyone who's not worked with uh, working for water before is taking very poor areas, putting people to work in the environment. And we should be enormously fortunate. After World War II, they did it as part of uh, building dams and building roads. We in this country, all the government expenditures put into the environment. And don't ever lose sight of that. When we're complaining about the team down the road that cut your yellowwood down by mistake, please believe that there's a big picture here that should be seen beyond that. How did we get involved? Uh, a big operation like this has to have facilitators. People can go in and deal with really angry ladies. And I'm the queen of dealing with really angry ladies. So um, I've been put basically in there. We started out as partnerships. Horticultural partnership, forestry partnership was required. Uh, we've been with the, with the environmental programs operation now since 1998. We have been through some hectic meetings along the way and hectic uh, operations, um, which I'm quite sure some of the, the more fancy, uh, really your forefront people uh, like Joan have been to those kind of meetings and of course legends like Dr. Ledger of course would have been in them for sure. Um, and we here are at a very, very weird and wonderful NEMBA regulations which is highly flawed and we're all running for the hills on this and it probably won't be implemented until the end of next year, but we're not worried about legislation anymore, we do the best we can. Social conflict, how did we start? We started with the jacarandas. I got a call from Dr. Guy Preston to say, listen, Sunday Times has just done an exposure, expose of us. We're gonna be shut down. Can you please come in? You've got 20 years of magazine and newspaper experience. I need your help. What do we do next? And uh, henceforth, um, we uh, basically diffused the jacaranda drama. I've been on conflict ever since then. I've worked for 10 years with the nursery industry, uh, having a big cadenza as whether the uh, uh, this had a double flower and they worked out it was uh, sterile and they got much the infuriation of every conservancy on town. They got it uh, through the system and they got it excluded. Um, I have to stand between Leslie Henderson and all the bunny jumping growers that think this is marvellous. Red fountain grass excluded as well. We had to come to some serious arrangements on a micro level, IUCN kind of style. They're allowed to grow um, cannas, they're allowed to still grow these things, but we basically are smear camping the, campaigning them in the media, and we sort of reckon if you've got an adjuratum, even if it's a hybrid one, you're a bit suspicious, so that's what we sort of hide. Sword ferns, obviously completely and utterly out of action, but uh, you know the growers will say, well, we've got the Boston, uh, the Boston, uh, the Boston uh, one, and the Boston one is fine, so we shouldn't be worried about it. That's fine. We've left them with a couple of yellow sword ferns. Uh, the dwarf uh, paracanthus, the round, huge fights over Montevidensis. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, during a, uh, Leslie Henderson is very friendly with the nursery industry now, but obviously they, we had our days and our times. Uh, the legislation was written that if, the, if it had a seed on it, it was bad. If it didn't have a seed on it, it wasn't. So the nursery industry say, we defy. You tell us, this particular yellow one that we are using here, it, it doesn't have a seed on it, therefore it's fine. So Leslie went round every nursery in town and found a seed. And needless to say, we went back to the nurseries, they had to destroy all their lantana, Montevidensis, and you still, particularly in the KZN area, see a lot of Montevidensis, but we did try. Um, and uh, we've had a lot of work on uh, water hyacinth, uh, trying to explain to them that they must leave 10% of the water hyacinth because Hildegard's bugs need to be in there. We're at the forefront of property developers who go berserk when they just put 25 million into a huge big boat on uh, one of the lakes and for three years there's nothing more than uh, water hyacinth which is so polluted that in actual fact the water hyacinth goes white because of the silica and the phosphorus coming down the river. So we send our teams in there. We have people phoning us saying please can the neighbours chop down our gum trees because of the hardy dolls. We have the bee industry people going absolutely berserk because we're cutting down all the gum trees. But we're in there, we're talking to them and we're dealing with them. 
One of the things we do is we have budgets to please people. And I'm coming to you with budgets to please you because I'm the pleaser of the team. Uh, we went to please the nursery industry who are completely and utterly con in, under control now. We don't even talk to them because they're so good friends, they're part of the government. Um, we set up a plant, me and said operation for them. We went in and we said, you can't plant those plants, but you can plant those plants. And we spent an awful lot of money going into 350 nurseries across the country, pleasing the nursery industry. Worked like a dream. We put posters together for we printed them, we sent them out, we made them feel important, we went and got the value added industries, we took them to Woolworths, these are made out of poplar uh, stems, this is part of job creation, we took them to Woolworths, we created swing tags, I'm a merchandising and promotion genius, I can do anything, you want to be on television, I'll give a phone call to any of my mates, you're on television next week, that's not a problem. <laughs> Communications, because I did, it was the editor of seven magazines and we produced 600 pages a month, I have an extensive operation in how to produce a magazine. You want the A to Z produced and two months later it's produced and there we are, we can hand it out. Digitally available, print on demand. Posters. I talked to my editors, they said, listen, you've only got 198 plants and now it's 300 plants, but really, you know, I'm tired of hearing the same story. So we had to get creative. We divided all the invasives into yellow, and then we divided them into different colors, and we had to chop up the same material, sending it out into the media in different types of ways. So we have color-coded all the invasives. We coded them in size, we've coded them in water and terrestrial. We, 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 by the time you've worked in my office two years, you know every invasive in and out like they're your best friends. We've been down to KwaZulu Natal, we've dealt with that a lot. We've terrified them with Leslie and Hildegard's maps of how the pom pom, sorry, the pom pom is going to take over the whole of the country and that entire um, high felt is going to be taken over. And if you don't do something, I'll send Joan from the Cullinan Conservancy to deal with you. And, I, <laughs> and obviously, <laughs> Patoli is in charge of all these teams and you're so important that Patoli's here as well. And those are the teams that he's in charge of. Those are all the guys he puts together. And he's a very powerful and very important person at environmental programs. So uh, after tea, make sure that you talk to Tony. We send people to Peter Maritzburg shows. We make them fit in. We go and promote Leslie and Hildegard's biocontrol at a very, very low level. What you've heard today is a very high level, specially designed for people like yourself. Uh, we are dealing with Mrs. Jones down the road, who actually just goes, eh, when she sees a bug. We love dealing with working on a bike. It's got the sexiest pictures in town. It's so easy to sell. Any radio guy will do it. Any television guy will do it. So these guys are my biggest mates because we can really, really, you know, guys jumping in helicopters and it's whole, you know, go and fight the thing. It's adrenaline and we're fighting the fires. So we have a lot to do with working on fire. What we've done it is at a, at a, at a very mass level. We've created uh, firewising gardens, how you firewise, so if, uh, if you're in the rural areas, how your particular home doesn't go up in smoke. We work with, great with, the, we work with the Australians, we work with the Americans, and I must be honest, if I could a full-time job at working for fire, I'd be, I'd be in there. We've told people that these are good plants for buying, buying for firewise, and these are bad plants. We put these onto tea bars, we printed about 5,000 of them, we issued them to every garden center in a, in a fire zone, trying to tell people what you should buy and what you shouldn't buy. We've also dealt with the pet traders. Um, I'm here with my colleague Warren Schmidt, who's one of the top uh, reptile uh, pet guys in the country. He ran the uh, crocodile um, uh, farm at Sun City and he uh, took Michael Jackson around the crocodiles and then he went and did the snake farms and he's done the Transvaal snake societies and when we get calls from the Kempton Park post office to say that somebody is posting three cobras from Pal Palakwani to Belleville and they're in um, They've been opened by some enthusiastic uh, postal worker who was just seeing if there was anything to steal. He found three cobras in there. Um, <laughs> we get called to the Kempton Park Post Office and much to the dismay of my housekeeper in the office, Warren keeps three bush cobras underneath our table at desks and office until Kauteng Provincial comes along and gets them. We've had very slow going on this. This is a very difficult group of people. We've made very slow going on it. In some ways we've had to bypass them. They are coming to the table, but if you're importing 20 uh, pythons from Pakistan every month, clearly you don't really want to talk to people like us. 
This industry is also run by six wholesalers, and the wholesalers sell the cages, the food, the, the everything to go with the pet trade, and as far as they're concerned, more pets is better for their business. We've had great difficulty getting into this business. So anyone with connections to python lovers and dragon whatevers, we'd be very grateful to hear from you. What are the current projects that we're working on that, in actual fact, we would be interested in you promoting and you helping? Uh, we've got a whole bunch of these. I'm going to go through them visually, uh, but I have to put some words up, otherwise I look like a complete non-academic. So those just words were by the way. We started out on the alien fish. Um, I was pulled into Cape Nature as a consultant to sort out um, their fish after somebody stood up and said, we're going to nuke 41 rivers, and the bass and the trout guys went berserk. And I was sent into conflict, managed the bass and the trout guys. So we went in there and we said to them, yes, we have got a whole bunch of aliens. The, 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 red, the red places are really where there's, you know, sort of really bad aliens. Um, but really what we're going to do is we're going to go in and we're going to nuke with Rotenone and various other things, possibly one or two or three kilometers. We're not going to get too hysterical. And after all, look at these, look at them, what we had to market. Save the Fainbosch fish. So we moved into the Western Cape, we told them to save the Fainbosch fish. And these Fainbosch fish have lovely, thank God, fortunately lovely names like Fiery Red Fins, so I could do a marketing campaign on them. Clan Fillish, and William Yellowfish wasn't such a good name as the fiery redfin, but we worked a bit with him and we went in. Of course, people like John Yeld are enormously helpful to us. They're very happy to come on these kind of um, campaigns. We, we took out all the bass out of a four uh, kilometer stretch in the Ronda Cut and then we uh, put a bit of Rotenone in there. Um, and uh, we had uh, lots of very chumpy students looking all cheerful and happy on the. On the on the river with Cus Hummin and we took them all out. Saving the waterfall, this is going to be a real problem. This duck has yellow feet. Donald Duck has yellow feet. We're dealing with generations of people who've grown up with cartoons of Donald Duck. So taking out Donald Duck is going to be a real problem. And this particular alien is really pretty, which offers a really bad marketing problem for me. But we're doing the best we can. We started out by saying you have to save your waters. These posters are available. They're both available in, in, in digital. You can take them down, load them from our websites and we now print on demand. Um, if you need them for your particular area, I'm available to give them to you. We then said, okay, once you've saved your waters, you also need to save the indigenous waterfowl. We created the positive campaign, save the Fainbos fish, save the waterfowl, because we actually can't create campaigns that say, kill bass and trout, kill mallard ducks. So we do the opposite, we promote what should be there, we do um, sort of situations where we say, okay, which are the four ducks that need to be really made important? And then we take these ducks and we turn them into superstars. And now you must have those ducks rather than the other ducks. Um, the mallard removals have started. Uh, Century City was the beginning, which was a real test. We've got all these wealthy people in flats looking down at us while we're taking out 20 mallards. There are our teams going, uh, very, very clever. They go in at 4 a.m. in the morning, they feed all the ducks. All the ducks at Century City go to sleep, and then they all wake up at 9 o'clock, and then you're missing 30 mallards. <laughs> <laughs> Going to be a bit more difficult in uh, Marina de Gama. At Marina de Gama, we have 800 mallards. I'm going to have to go in and do a lot of conflict management. There, Marina de Gama, there are a lot of very grumpy people there. That particular suburb has had a bit of a, a socio-economic decline lately on account of its sort of closeness to the Cape Flats. And uh, we need to go in there. We need to do a lot of work before any envir in ecologically environmental people uh, get into that particular area. Uh, and uh, we're not even going to start on because of Natal. Uh, Isabella went round and shot a few mallards with buckshot uh, a couple of uh, months ago. And uh, everybody's up in arms. So there's an enormous amount of work to be done in KZN. Um, conflict we brought in um, because at the beginning, at the in all conservancies, one of the biggest conflicts is invasives. This is the Tigerberg Nature Reserve. Lovely place, huge problem. Huge problem is that there are hugely wealthy suburbs. Plattercloof is on this side here, and on this side there's Tigerberg. And they are beautiful suburbs. And they are people who used to run the country a couple of decades ago, so they think they're quite important, and they really don't take to, there's a generational issue. 75-year-old guys who used to run the country are not crazy about 35-year-old females who ran nature reserves and are totally into the invasive species issues. So we've got some personal issues there as well. We have gardening versus nature conservation here. This girl's trying to, um, trying to basically keep 
567 endemic species, I'm sorry, endemic species. The guys in the suburbs want to drag their weavers up the, up, the, up the hill and they want to put a weaver on top of the hill and they want to have a bright lace on the top of the hill. So there are people who are having a problem. The hacking teams, uh, a lot of them from conservation, have spent every Saturday for the last three years taking out little areas and cleaning them up and then all of a sudden working for water says to Tigerberg, listen we've got six million left over, would you like five teams to come in? And the poor conservation people who've been hacking quietly in one corner of the conservation are totally offended that 60 people from working for water from the local sort of squatter camp suddenly pitch up and now they're going to be taking over the job of the hackers. And then there's misunderstanding and there's miscommunication. Uh, the pine trees. Twelve pine trees at the top of Tigerberg Mountain were taken down. The people had an absolute fit. They were there when Pa went through. They were there when we had the great trek. And can't take them. The Bontebok. They want to take the Bontebok out because they're extra liberals. They're not going to be in that area. So in actual fact, you tell these area people that that gorgeous thing on the left-hand side is supposed to be a lowland buck. It's not supposed to be climbing the mountain. And if he's breaking his breaking legs, we've had two Bontebok with broken legs on account of the climbing up and down the the mountain, and we're going to put these glorious grey reed back, I think they are. Of course they're never seen because they hide their mountain. These guys just stand and look gorgeous like cows, and there's a huge problem. And you've got the friends having a complete fit as well. Then you've got to have a, a, a in Tigerberg, this particular virulent disease walked in, and basically they accused working for water of spreading it with Hildegard's stuff, and in actual fact trying to kill it from the side, whereas in actual fact we had absolutely nothing to do with this disease, which is killing very, very old pine trees. But because we chopped 12 down at the top of the mountain, we're accused of taking them all out with pitch cancer as well. So we have to go in there, I have to have meetings, I have to discuss with them, no, we're not sabotaging you, everything's transparent, we actually mean quite well. Latest project we've been sent on, uh, sand parks. They are, have so much money being pumped into environmental programs. They have to create so many jobs. They are looking for enthusiastic and interesting ways to do it. They have said to the nursery industry, would you mind coming and helping us put an indigenous nursery in every single sand parks across the country? And if you have a, you know, really good friends or whatever, we'll come and put one in your place. They desperately need to put three job creation people here in all of these particular parks. So we went round. We were sent up to Mapungubwe, had a look at there, that's where there's going to be, uh, there's 300,000 rand that's going to be spent on an indigenous nurse, nursery at Mapungubwe. Uh, Karoo National Park, the guy was given 250,000 rand. Uh, he's an ex-masseur uh, from uh, Seapoint. Uh, he's married to the um, uh, chief conservation officer there, and he just was bored, and he thought it was a great idea. So he took the 300,000 and put a nursery up, and then phoned us up and said, I've got the nursery, now what do I do? Um, in this particular area, somebody's gone in and given them a hell of a story about permaculture, which means it's all small scale. Our nursery guys went in there and said, what the hell are we going to do with permaculture? Again, we've got conflict. We've got conservation people. We've got horticulture people. We've got permaculture people, and they've all got their own ideas. The, the nursery guys wanted to go in there and put a cash crop in that they could sell 15,000 of one species to make money for this particular community. And they're faced with this kind of chip-chop, most magnificent permaculture you've ever seen in your life. Then we go out to the um, Palabora, we're taking the longest road. Uh, that particular guy there is uh, the chief uh, in Dungarees, and that's a PRO, and he's been spent 30 years at John Foster Square, and he was brought in, and a couple of others, and then obviously these are very terrified, uh, sorry, very terrified working for water people who've pulled my Mornay full hammer, a nurseryman from Cape Town, and myself in to say, what are we going to do here? They wanted 50 hectares of lala palms. Anyone who knows about lala palms knows they're wetland species, they live in the Kruger National Park, and they certainly are not going to be put on 50 hectares of dry, polybora, mopani, no water. So we said, well, where's the water? So they, we walked, we walked, we walked, we walked, five kilometers. <laughs> And so uh, we walked five kilometers um, down, and they said, there's the water. And every 50, every 500 meters was a hole. And this was a pipeline from a dam to the city of Palabora, supplying all the residents with water. They said, we just need to go down that and get all the water. And I'm like, oh, whoa, guys, I don't know about this. You know, this is not something we're going to do. Then I said to them, where's the electricity? No, there's the poles. So, we're looking at it, there's 2.4 million, this people in parks project, 2.4 million in this project, we've got to find out what to do with this. So, fortunately, Sand Parks now employs chiefs themselves, so Chief 
Marcelo is now going with me to, te to talk to Chief Warawara from Guiani, and we've got a big meeting next week to say, what are we going to do with this now? Golden Gate, much easier. Golden Gate's close. A lot of the nurserymen are very happy to go for the weekend to Golden Gate to work with these guys. We're already working on what they can, uh, the buyer prospect out of the park, what can be grown, what will be sold. We'll make it sustainable. And we have partnerships. We have partnerships between private sector and government. And we are, if we can get a partnership between the nursery industry in this country and sand parks, we'll be doing terribly well. And you're next on the list. These are the uh, plants that potentially the nurseries identified. Everyone's getting very much more indigenous than they were 10 or 15 years ago. We, uh, we believe that our interest in indigenous via this invasive issue has uh, actually increased the, the quantity of indigenous species in local nurseries in the Cape from 10% to 60% and in Kauteng from 2% to 40%. Eco furniture factories, they're now putting coffins together, they're taking the pine, they're taking the gum, they're putting them into factories. We were told they're going to be 12 factories. There's some outrageous amount of money, 400 million or something, to be involved in this. Um, they're setting up working for water factories. They've got to make 270,000 desks um, in these factories. Uh, we are 7 million school desks short. So they're taking back old metal desks, they're refitting them with invasive pine on the top of the desks. Uh, there's uh, one of my colleagues, Moya Fulhammer, looking at the desk. We're taking all of those broken things in and we're refitting them uh, with working for water workers and the workers are being put in there. Uh, we have a huge job, jobs fund uh, uh, budget for that. We're making uh, coffins. We are the leaders of cheap coffins. Please. Near a cheap coffin, I'm your lady. Um, we can now cook our own wood. There's a whole big process. I'm having a serious one to ten on forestry at the moment. Uh, those are flat, packed school desks ready to go out to places which are not close. And uh, finally, our final project that we really are having a big cadenza about is famine weed. Uh, we've renamed it. We renamed it ourselves. Um, tra uh, Trafford is uh, one of the leading members of the KwaZulu Natal Invasive Species Forum, and Trafford was on the team that renamed this. We decided nobody would understand Parthenium, particularly if you were in Pongolo or Jacini, and we renamed it Famine Weed. So everything is now going out Famine Weed. Dr. Ian MacDonald lives in the north of KwaZulu Natal. He's one of the leading lights on this. Uh, he's getting all the pictures. Everything that you see barring the green bushes is famine weed. It's a huge problem in India. It's a huge problem in Kenya. We're working with one of um, our South African guys, uh, Arno, who is in Kenya at the moment, and this is what they do. But effectively, if famine weed goes across your rural area, you can't have cows because they get pink lipped. You, the, the, the livestock is a problem. Uh, rhinos are a problem. Rhinos in, in, in Filozi have been taken pictures of with huge big red mouths on account of them eating this dreadful parthenium. And there's a major 25 million uh, rand uh, uh, report gone into the treasury at the moment to get money and we're looking at putting up um, huge big banners in every northern KwaZulu Kwa Natal town. Uh, that's a, these are the beginning, these are the few first posters to come out, what it has to be done. There's your rhino, which is called the red-lipped rhino. That picture has been around for an awful lot of time. Uh, on the red lip uh, rhino, uh, and this is how you identify it. Obviously, as conservancies, we think it's very important that you know what this jolly thing is. Um, it's going into an area where English is not necessarily the, the, the lingua franca. Obviously, everything is being translated. These days, uh, Google can translate any language, so from our perspective, very easy to translate into any language of the area. How do you uh, get hold of us, and how do you deal with us? Um, we are on Facebook. We have to be young. We have to deal with the next generation. Um, on Facebook we deal with, um, we tell people about the house grows, we tell them about the latest invasive species plants. Um, we have our news updates. Um, we have a complete and utter encyclopedia of everything you want to know on, on every invasive that there is. I have 15 um, interns, current uh, Sabenzas, coming into my office on the 1st of October. Um, and obviously we basically get them to work so that by the time they walk out of my office they are biosecurity officers of knowledge for Tambo. Uh, I'm now being uh, seconded to the biosecurity unit and we're training people for biosecurity South Africa which hopefully will be in action by next year. At the moment they're going across to New Zealand and Australia to see how to set up the whole biosecurity operation. 
Um, we deal hugely with Cape Town. They were by far the most uh, people ahead of the team. We deal with uh, Durban. Um, uh, Trafford is one of our heroes down there, and I'm sorry if there's an awful lot you have to listen to today, Trafford, which you know, but uh, bearing in mind the audience, I think I did need to go through everything. Um, and we run YouTube. Uh, we have our team here. We have John. We have Lucas. Lucas, who's probably uh, Rejoice, Deputy Minister Rejoice's best friend. Uh, Re Re Lucas and Rejoice, we call them the odd couple. They go over every wetland and every down, every coast. And Lucas takes pictures of Rejoice, and she's absolutely thrilled to bits with us. Uh, we go on YouTube, we go to the Cape St. Francis f uh, Symposium. If you want to listen to any fantastic speeches, like the one that you listened to Hildegard, and I must tell you, Hildegard's speech today was entirely different to the one she gave uh, at the Cape St. Francis uh, Symposium. Hildegard is, is, is on YouTube in full colour, and you go on to YouTube and listen to Hildegard. Again. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, there is our newsletter. We ultimately would love to... We, we've didn't realize you were as big as you were. 110 conservancies in KZN, 70 in, 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 in other provinces. We, we're mind blown by how big you are. Uh, we obviously would love all your people to know a bit more about it. We have newsletters that go out three or four or five times a year. Uh, and obviously, when I, by the time I get 15 interns, they're probably going to go out monthly. Um, spotter networks, people like you are definitely identified, particularly the hikers amongst you. We have spotter networks up in Cape Town, and we have a spotter network um, up in uh, Durban. GPSs, you upload them, you say what you've seen. These are only for target plants. We can't have a GPS a spotter network for Lantana or any of the obvious ones. They've cho chosen, I think, 10 Trafford in Durban, and they've chosen about 18 or 16 in Cape Town. Um, so Durban has just got their spotter network up. You go and find one of these particular 10 plants, you GPS it, you send it to them, and uh, obviously um, a, a totally a rapid response team goes out. Or if it's not rapid, it's next week rapid response team goes out. <laughs> um, finally, why do we need you? What do you need? Working for Water is starting to take suggestions from Work, uh, WWF, it's taking suggestions from conservancies, it's taking suggestions from private landowners who are created into groups. We don't give any money to individual people, we give them to groups. But conservancies are so well situated to create themselves into a group, whereby they can apply for money to have teams on their conservancies. And yes, it's not entirely free. Uh, we pay for the labor. You've got to put in manager uh, or, or manage it yourself. And we can put anything from between one and eight teams into your conservancy if you apply for the money. And yes, it will take a bit of time. And it's not instant. And this is not private sector. But the point is that we environmental programs have so much money that the landowner incentives program is probably going to be one of the fastest growing operations within environmental programs. You can't have 700 million given to you in one year from the government without expanding this into a partnership thing whereby we bring all the conservancies and the landowners and all the people into our operations and we say to them, uh, can you come and help us? This is a national initiative, we would love you to come and help us. So we please, if you can manage an invasive team and you would like to say there are particular problems in your conservancy where you would like teams, I think the, the, the uh, totally end of October, uh, uh, I think it's middle of October or end of October is the next deadline for proposals and then obviously over the next six months they adjudicate the proposals and then you create a business operation within your own uh, area. There are two sites I would put you to. There's the unofficial Working for Water site. Andrew Wannenberg has put out a very good site with all the, if you want to know where the invasives in your area are, they are all mapped and they are all available online from this particular site. So that is the unofficial Working for Water site. And then, of course, the mothership for all information, particularly for schools, children, and people who are lesser, lesser informed than yourselves. Thank you.